Welcome back to AP World Simplified. Today we're going to be talking about the classical religions of Hinduism, Confucianism, and Christianity. We'll start off by discussing Hinduism, the religion that has no one single creator and is rather a mix of local beliefs in the caste system along with the Vedic traditions of the uh, Indo-Europeans. These beliefs are going to be amalgamated and codified in a series of documents uh, ranging from the Sanskrit scriptures to the Upanishads uh, in a series of documents known as the Vedas, and those are going to be the codifying documents of Hinduism, roughly spanning from the 7th to 5th century BCE. Now, Hinduism, like many other South Asian beliefs, are going to believe in an eternal soul, or an Atman, that is going to uh, go through cycles of rebirth, uh, known as reincarnation. Now, Hinduism is actually going to be defined by a very rigid hierarchy. Now, within these ranks, or Varnas, uh, such as, for example, the uh, Vaishya class, where you're going to have you know, landowners, merchants, and other sort of higher-up citizens. There's going to be their own little mini-hierarchy in that if you are a higher uh, position in there, uh, known as a jati, uh, you're going to be discouraged or even forbidden, perhaps, from intermarrying someone of a lower jati or certainly a lower uh, varnas. Uh, so that's going to mean, mean that what you're born into is essentially what you're stuck with. The only way to move up is to fulfill your worldly role. Uh, whether that's a, a Brahmin as a priest, a Kshatriya, which is a king or a warrior, a uh, Vaishya, which is going to be more of the uh, uh, artisan, merchant, landowner class, or you're more of a servant or laborer in the Shudras class, fulfilling your duty to keep the world going, essentially, is known as uh, your Dharma. And if your Dharma is fulfilled, that accrues for your soul, good or bad, in the case of you not fulfilling your duty, uh, karma. If your karma is good, in the next life, when you reincarnate, you would potentially move up uh, within uh, your own Varnas or perhaps to another uh, Varnas. And that is how one would eventually move up and up and up the hierarchy after multiple lifetimes and reach the pinnacle or the top. And if they they fulfill their varna, or they fulfill their uh, dharma completely at the very highest uh, threshold for the Brahmin. They would uh, join the the universe, the uh, Brahmin, the sort of one being in unity that is a, sort of a metaphysical concept in Hinduism. Uh, that is the oneness that unifies all of the universe. Now, the ruling classes certainly liked this uh, system as it sort of justified their position as an inherited position from their uh, good karma from their previous life or lifetimes, um, and. That's also going to be something that's going to make it more popular when it spreads to later in the uh, post-classical in the post-classical era uh, to Southeast Asia. Regardless, this is going to be a functioning local um, social construct essentially. Uh, this society that's set up under the caste system of the Hindu caste system uh, is not really going to require a, a centralized large empire to run it. Even on a local basis, people have a very good idea of what they should be doing, and there are, at least believed, consequences for their actions or lack of actions in the next lifetime. That's going to make it quite difficult for India to be very easily conquered and unified under one central empire. Now, while we will have a couple that attempt to do so, like the Maurya and Gupta empires, uh, and they will maintain um, their empires for a couple centuries, it's going to be very difficult to uproot this already existing caste system from India, uh, along with the already large amount of people and diverse languages and cultures that exist in the Indian subcontinent. Now, as Hinduism is codified and forming and, and establishing itself in India, so too to the northeast we have a new brand of philosophy or religion developing in China known as Confucianism. Started by Confucius in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, just before and during uh, the Warring States period, that chaotic sort of conflict and death-filled period in Chinese history, um, you're going to have uh, Confucius himself codifying the beliefs of Confucianism in what is called the Analects. Now, coming at a time when the Zhu Dynasty is on the way out and this Warring States period is uh, beginning to sort of manifest itself, uh, Confucius and a lot of others uh, began to sort of emphasize uh, law and order and social harmony as one of the priorities for Chinese society. Uh, when legalism would come along later, it was quickly adopted into um, Confucian beliefs in that a centralized government should have uh, a large amount of control and, and provide that law, order, and stability for the people of China. And that's going to be the core focus of Confucianism in that the basic goal is to establish a functional, organized, uh, orderly, and socially harmonious uh, society in China. Now, Confucius focused on a sort of bottom-up approach in that the one should focus on the individual, 
their education, their uh, realization and understanding of morality, and their sense of duty and responsibility uh, to themselves and to their families. And that those families should also incorporate those ideals and function in a very orderly, uh, and in this case, patriarchal hierarchy, where at the top you have a father or father figure, uh, and then the sons, the mother, and the daughter, and they are going to be uh, respectful and obedient to the father of that household and the people that are above them. In return, however, the father or the patriarchal patriarch of the family is not going to exploit the people below them. They are there to protect and provide for them uh, and function as a benevolent overseer uh, in a very socially harmonious family unit. Now this family unit is meant to function as a sort of model for Chinese society as a whole. So rather than being at the top the father or the patriarch of the family, you're going to have the emperor or the uh, local elite or official that governs and presides over uh, that area of China. Additionally, just how the father is, or the patriarch is supposed to be uh, sort of a benevolent ruler who is, of course, obeyed, but also is responsible for protecting and providing for the people below them. So that, that would ensure that a Confucian ruler was someone who did not abuse their power, but actually would, had the uh, needs and even wants in mind of the people below them. Another core component of Confucianism would be the adherence to rituals and ceremonies uh, tied into this Confucian sort of religion, uh, as well as former ancestors. That, of course, coming from the traditional filial piety or ancestral veneration that was practiced in East Asia. Now, the purpose of these rituals and traditions are actually going to be to teach one uh, personal responsibility, uh, as well as obedience to this overall functioning uh, social system, or in this case, philosophical or religious system, um, that one would also adhere to with the obedience to the state. Now, these Confucian beliefs were not exactly made, weren't, weren't made state official until the uh, Han Dynasty, just after the Qin. Uh, that would be Emperor Wu of Han in the first and second century BCE, uh, would officially sanction uh, the uh, traditions and rituals and adherence to Confucianism, even beginning the requirements for officials to have to be educated in Confucian uh, philosophy uh, before being admitted into the government. Now, we're not talking about the Confucian examination system per se, uh, as we'll discuss in the Tang Dynasty in the post-classical era, but this is the beginning of this acceptance uh, by the Chinese government of a unifying uh, philosophy in the form of Confucianism to maintain social uh, harmony, law, and order. Now, while Hinduism and Confucianism were developing and actually already developed um, in East Asia and South Asia, with in mind adherence to this rigid social system uh, or caste system that was made to maintain social harmony, in the West, uh, in the Roman Empire, specifically in the, uh, the, the former state of Israel, we're going to have a a blossoming new religion known as Christianity uh, that comes out of Judaism and their belief in, in sort of waiting for a messiah. The focus more of Christianity is going to be on uh, speaking truth and being kind uh, and also being forgiving and understanding. And these core fundamentals are going to be taught not only by the preceding Jude Jewish beliefs, but also uh, by a person named Jesus of Nazareth, who many of the Jews uh, believed to be an actual messiah. Some, of course, were expecting a spiritual messiah, but even more, considering the fact that they were under um, occupation by Rome, were waiting for a militaristic messiah. Now, all the stories and teachings of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, as well as the disciples, would become popular. It would receive some initial persecution um, and even attempt to be stomped out by the Roman Empire in which it... Um, was developed. Now the Romans were more concerned about this militaristic messiah, uh, believing that Jesus, and perhaps, or certainly the Jewish people following him, may be um, more motivated to revolt than to have a spiritual uh, rebirth. So the Romans, of course, under emperors such as Nero and others, are going to directly persecute uh, Christians, thus not allowing Christians to be out in the open about their beliefs. However, that is not going to stop Christianity from spreading like wildfire throughout uh, the Roman Empire. Aside from using the benefits of the Roman road system, trade networks, and the benefits of Roman citizenship, um, missionaries such as Paul of Tarsus and St. Patrick are going to find a pretty easy time in spreading the word of Christianity uh, due to its uh, emotional appeal with its you know emphasis on forgiveness and kindness as well as its egalitarian approach and it is it is very much open to uh, all it was referred to in the Bible as Gentiles meaning all non-Jews and Jews included but that meant men and women as well so there wasn't a sense of this rigid hierarchy within Christianity, which made it, which made it very appealing uh, to the poor uh, and uh, 
occupied peoples of the Roman Empire. Aside from the persecution by the Romans, Christianity also ran into many obstacles in converting people, particularly in Europe, where pagan religions were still rather popular. Uh, Christianity uh, and its missionaries would use a series of I guess you would say tactics such as um, the top-down approach in which they would focus on converting the kings or lords or whoever was in charge of the area uh, and having that conversion of the top officials bleed down uh, to the lower classes as often you had to adopt the same uh, religion as your rulers back then. Additionally, they're going to also take these pagan holidays and temples and relics uh, such as, you know, uh, the, the old pagan uh, date that was Christmas and turn those into Christian holidays, temples, uh, or relics. So they sort of syncretized the beliefs that were already there, making it easier for these pagans or more comfortable for these pagans to convert to Christianity. All these factors combined uh, are going to result in Christianity exploding throughout the Mediterranean and into Europe um, and also spreading along the uh, Silk Road um, and down into East Africa uh, to what is now um, roughly the Ethiopia region, uh, which would formerly be known as Axum. Now while it would take a while for the Roman Empire to adopt and officially state sanction um, Christianity, as was happening with the Han Dynasty and Confucianism in the East. Uh, at first, um, converts, emperor converts of the of the Christian faith, such as Constantine, uh, would pass the Edict of Milan, which allowed toleration and, and protected Christians from persecution. Less than a century later in 380 CE, the Edict of Thessalonica would allow the Roman Empire to fully dive into Christianity, adopting it as its official state religion and protecting and in fact encouraging Christians uh, throughout the Roman Empire. Now while more could be said about each of these religions, in fact a lot more could be said, that's all you really need to know as far as the fundamental structures uh, and key components in the actual AP test. And don't forget, if you're interested in access to all of the videos I have about AP World or other tools for AP students and teachers, be sure to check out my website at morganapteaching.com. Thanks for watching.